Hey, what's up, guys? It's Arlie, and I'm here with another video. And today we are doing something a bit different. We are checking out our boy Andrew Yang. So, if you guys don't know who he is, he is the presidential uh, presidential candidate of the United States of America. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and give Andrew Yang some love. You are getting. And so, if you want to help me on you, then like vote me into office. <laughs> Yo, what's going on everybody? Welcome to a special presidential episode of Fun Rose Food. We are here today having some Taiwanese night market snacks with none other than 2020 presidential candidate Andrew Yang, everybody! Hey, thanks. Great to be here. I love Taiwanese food. I love night market. Let's do it. You are running for the president of the U.S. I think it's kind of cool because... Like, it's crazy because he's, like, messing with YouTubers, you know? Like, back then, like, this would never happen. But Internet creators are, like, more and more mainstream now. So I think that's kind of cool. Yes, I am. Declared, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's all official. Our next guest is a 2020 Democrat candidate for the presidency. Andrew Yang is with us. Since the last time we saw you in New York, a lot has happened. Let's talk about it. How many snacks? Let's go. And by the way, this is not a political endorsement of any kind. Andrew is just an extremely interesting person with a lot to say, and he's running for president. We are looking at a pretty amazing Taiwanese snack spread right now. I see lots of raised eggs, raised pork, braised tofu. I got an almond milk tea with boba, and this is spot on. What of the food here is looking the tastiest to you and the most familiar? I, I love the minced pork over rice. Um, I, I love the, the Luton. Anytime I'm in Taiwan, I'm, I'm hungry. I just go to a 7-Eleven and get one of these bad boys. I love the braised tofu. I'm going to stick myself one of these right now. Would you like a piece of Taiwanese blood cake? That's for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. But I got papaya milk. That's, that's pretty. Oh, that's a good choice, man. So you have soft tofu with the thousand-year-old century duck egg. You know, I don't think I've had that, that together. I just I didn't even see the eggs. I just saw the tofu and thought, like, delicious-looking tofu. When you went back to Taiwan and you told your family out there that you were running for the president of the United States, what did they say? So they were like, oh, really? That's nice. Nah! <laughs> like, go on to the conversation. Yeah, the most classic. It, it hadn't hit the, the news yet. No, it hadn't hit the news. What's been happening? So I've been around the country spreading the word about me, the campaign, how we need to build a different kind of economy, raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. The, the average donation is only $11. So my fans are even cheaper than Bernie Sanders' fans were at, yeah. at this point, if we don't step up and help uh, lead society in the right direction, it's just going to get deeper and darker and nastier for Asian Americans, for all Americans. So I got turned on to that really by Donald Trump winning in 2016, where I saw that happen and it just shocked me into action, honestly. And I'll say, the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian guy who likes numbers. And what we need to do is we need to take Donald Trump and then swing it the other direction. He wants to freeze time and like turn the clock backwards. We need to turn the clock forward, and that's what I'm going to do. You know older folks that are like in America and they just miss the, the days of like the Beach Boys and Elvis. Those movies with Will Ferrell where he always wears a mustache are always, obviously, I don't want the world to go back to that time. Shout out to Bruce Lee. Oh, Bruce Lee was a pop in Asia, I believe, during that moment. What do you say when people say, Andrew, of course you want to move forward. Look, just look at the individual positioning and incentives. But I would like to turn the clock back, and that would benefit me. I know what you mean. So if you look at the numbers, if you were born in the United States in the 1950s, there was a 93% chance that you were going to do better than your parents. You fast forward to people born in the 90s, which I think might include you guys, if you were born in the 1990s in the U.S., then you only have a 50-50 chance of being better off than your parents. And that's, that's insane when you think about that, because back then, you know, like, I understand, because back then, if you went to college, that meant, like, you were definitely going to be successful. So that could have been a major factor in the 1950s, plus the economic opportunities that most of these families had, and most of them were white, too. If you think about it, most of them have the general wealth, but now that wealth has been democratized, and it is a different time in America now, I think that even when we've moved towards technology more and more towards uh, economic, uh, like economic like diversity, 
it got to a point to where like innovation kept moving forward in automation, industrial revolution, things like that that changed the course of human history in America. And it's really changed the economics a lot and a college degree doesn't necessarily mean you can be a value to society. Yes, you can in some factors, but you'll be working for people or you'll be barely making it or you'll be in debt. And Andrew Yang is a very smart guy. He's been looking at the numbers and the data, and I'm starting to think that, you know, I understand why parents are pushing on their kids, hey, get a degree. You can go anywhere with a degree, but, I mean, now that's not the case, you know? Like, think about it like this. At my age right now, just from doing YouTube and doing entrepreneurship, and yes, I am going back to school and I still work a regular job, but just like with all my incomes together, I make more than most college students or most people who are out of college. I make more. Right now, I'm on track to make 75000 this year, and that's not nothing to boast about. I'm not saying, I, I feel like you should be making 100000 but what I'm saying is, you know, like, if I, like, I feel like you don't need to make that much, but the point is, for someone who didn't go the traditional route, kind of did things my own way, I am probably would have ended up having more money in my pocket doing it the way I've already done it than going to school. Just getting out of high school, and I did go to college right out of high school, but I didn't necessarily, like because of not only financial circumstances but I wasn't happy with the, what I was pursuing the reason why I'm going back to school is because now I know what I want to do and I think doing YouTube and messing with technology and things like that and social media taught me what I want to do um, and that you know sometimes you got to find what you want to it's all about finding what you want to do now it's not always about what you want to do. Of course, I worked hard. I worked a couple of jobs. I worked. Uh, I was at times where I didn't have a car. I didn't have a place to live. Uh, this is the nicest place I've ever had. Like I lived in a roach-infested apartment when I got out of college, and everyone's like, "You're a failure," and this, this, and that. Now things will turn around very quickly for me. I got a nice car. I got things like that, which I don't care about the car. Most of the money that I spend goes back into YouTube. So like, <laughs> I need to fix this camera. I know, but anyways, like what I'm saying is, like I, I do believe in entrepreneurship and having your own multiple incomes because I think in this day and age having just one income even if it's a really good job that pays you real real well every year even if you're making big bucks you're still an employee and what can they do to an employee they can fire you and if you're a CEO what if a company goes under I think that ind now independent unless you own that company it depends if you own the company that makes sense you're gonna get paid regardless but I'm saying that if you don't have some sort of independent incomes from different places so you don't fall I think that we're doing a lot of people in this country a disservice and I like the idea of the universal basic income because basically that's what having a multiple income is he's basically giving people a thousand or two thousand dollars a month and if they're still working a job on top of that that extra money that's there is a check they don't have to worry about if they're spending it wisely or using it wisely or saving it wisely so I think the idea that Andrew Yang is doing what he's doing is really, really fucking cool, in my opinion. Anyways, let's keep going. Numbers going lower and lower. So when people say they want to turn the clock backwards, what they really mean is that they want an America where their kids are going to have better lives than they did, and they don't see that happening now. But you can't try and get there by literally like reversing time or saying, like, how, how are things in the 60s and 70s? What happens when the nostalgia for the old economics manifest itself in more of a nostalgia for the old racial diversity. America is heading towards uh, being majority minority in 2045. So that's 27 years from now. So 27 years from now, the majority of Americans will be minorities. That is insane when you think about it. But 
Um, a lot of people don't know this, that when it comes to genetics, colored people have always populated the world more than um, fair-skinned human beings. Um, but as you know, throughout history, it's always been the fair-skinned human beings. Not to say that all light-skinned or white people or Asian, all those people, I'm not saying that those people are evil and treacherous. I'm just saying that throughout history, they have done some of the most treacherous things from slavery to things like that. Um, not to say that, like I said, um, their genes, uh, their genes are recessive. So, uh, they're more likely to be washed out with genetics than any other race in the, uh, world. But just know that also those genetics can always come back. It's not like they can be eradicated. Like, black people can't be eradicated. Asian people can't be eradicated. There's always that bloodline that can come back and surface. So, that goes to show you, like, you know, um, white people came to America, took this land, built this great country, and, uh, you know, and... It's crazy now that in 27 years from now, in 2045, it would be majority minorities. That's insane when you think about it. A land that was built for them is now going to be majority minorities. Nothing against that. There's nothing against that because, honestly, like, of course, there's bad people in every race and things like that. So don't take this as, like, an offense. That anyone can be racist, anyone can be bigoted, anyone can be horrible people, and there's good people in every uh, group of uh, people. So you gotta understand that. But um, it is a little, it is kind of ironic that the the people who oppress minorities and blacks and all that end up being a minority in their own country. That's insane. That's something to think about right there. And I think. Andrew Yang is thinking about the future, you know. He's trying to keep it to where, um, he's trying to keep it to where, like, America is moving forward in a great direction instead of moving backwards. Because he is right. Donald Trump is kind of trying to move it backwards. Not in a sense that he's racist. Donald Trump may not even be racist. But I'm saying that he's trying to move it backwards in terms of the, the old America where everyone worked here and this, this, and that. But, Andrew Yang's like, look, things are going to be automated. There's no point in trying to create all these jobs that would be eradicated in the first place. We need to move towards a more social economic, um, some type of social economic, creative, entrepreneur, um, innovative economic uh, society. So I understand from Andrew Yang's point not saying just robots but just in terms of innovation we need to move towards humans always working on what can change the world instead of what can just keep it running and that's what jobs do jobs keep things in check and running and that's a good thing so you can innovate but he's saying that the innovation's gotten to a point to where we don't even have to work general labor jobs no more robots can all can be that can automate those jobs, and we can focus more on innovating, using our ideas. And I think he's just getting ready for the future. And, you know, it's going to be more minorities, too. So you got to think about that. These people who generally in the past were uneducated in America due to uh, circumstances, whether that was racial discrimination or just not having the money, maybe coming from another country as an immigrant, those opportunities, it's gotten to that point, it's gotten to that line where equality is finally almost here. The only thing left is financial equal, uh, inequality. That's what's left. So now that we have this this uh, chance to really change our economy to be based on our actual skills and assets and use those ideas as currency instead of always focusing on the money be in the currency. I think I get the ideas of Andrew Yang completely. And will it be, I don't think it's always good because our currency is based on a value per value system. But if they can figure it out, if they can figure out how to make this work, I think it would be a great step in the right direction for not just Americans, but maybe for the whole world to look at. We're not the greatest, in, the greatest country and richest country in the world for no reason. 
we had a dark past we were able to grow from it build such nice buildings and things like that and while we still have problems right in this country for not only blacks and all types of ethnic groups sometimes even white people I will say this we are the only country in the world who has actively talked about it and tried to hop on it think about it slavery would not slavery has been throughout history but it, when it was black slavery, it's when people actually gave a fuck and started talking about it. Now, slavery's not right in any way. And black, according to history, I've seen from American slavery, was probably the worst in history. Some of the worst in history. They, but let's not go into detail about that. It was the first time on the world stage that there was a war about it. There was a war about state rights. There was a war, hey, I should have the right to do this in my state and slavery was a part of that that was why the south and the north fought and it's kind of cool to see that people gave a fuck at some point to a degree and because it passed in the history of other slave forms of slavery there was no talk it just happened so i think um america is like the first country to put everything out there and then it just gets fixed over time and um, I just I don't think this country is bad. I just think we have a lot of issues we need to solve. And Andrew Yang seems like a man that wants to solve some of these problems that we have in America, and it's so cool, man. What you would expect to happen is for the shrinking white majority to become more and more uh, nostalgic for the past and feel culturally threatened and insecure. And then you add into that the fact that their economic insecurity is going up and up because we're getting rid of the truck driving jobs, the retail jobs, the manufacturing jobs. And so that's going to manifest itself as a lot of uh, racial hostility. And then if you think, oh, what would you expect to happen in the beginning, in like the third inning of that? You'd expect maybe Donald Trump, maybe a rise of racism, maybe like outbreaks of shootings and violence, all of which are happening, all of this stuff is unfortunately consistent with a narrative of this country disintegrating over the next 30 years uh, as it becomes more diverse. Dude, you just painted a super bleak picture of the future. And then you have this this liberal narrative which puts everything under the umbrella of racism. Right. It's like, if things are going badly, then it's racism. And then if you're a poor white, you're looking up being like, how the heck am I racist? Like, I'm just like trying to put food on the table. Maybe I grew up in a town where it's literally just geographically there are no minorities looking at it like, how can I be racist when I didn't even meet a minority? That if someone can't pay their bills, that mindset of scarcity reduces their functional IQ by 13 points, which is one standard deviation. So that's like if you put someone in a position where it's like they're living week to week or paycheck to paycheck, and then you ask them to care about something like climate change, they're not really going to have the comfort. They're not high enough on, uh, on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs to bring them. Right, because like once you're hungry, dude, when you're hungry and you're broke and you're, dude, even with, you know, like, to be honest, when I, I'm with my girlfriend and if I'm broke, I'm thinking about how can I make some money more than I'm thinking about being with her. That's when you're hungry and you need something, all other shit goes out the window. We all know that. You don't even need that scale of IQ points that Andrew Yang was talking about to understand that if you come from the fucking struggle. I used to eat noodles every fucking day. And what we have to do is we have to try and reverse that mindset of scarcity by putting uh, some more money in their hands so that they don't have to worry about their survival. As a metropolitan, you know, young, middle-class Asian male, why would I care about truck drivers in Iowa they don't care about me? But I'm actually going to reverse it a little bit and say, how would it feel for a young, urban, Asian-American man to have an Asian guy in the White House? Because right now, if you're an Asian-American guy, there's a sneaking feeling you have that you're allowed to become this successful in America, but you're not allowed to become this successful. Bamboo ceiling. Yeah. <clears throat> well, like, robots can't be leaders. They can be successful workers. I've been with the people who are, like, supposed to be running the country, and I've got news. Like, we are as good or better than any of them. Asians do probably have some self-belief that even if the rest of America was burning around them, that they would be okay. We are bred to think, yeah. like, no one's going to help us. We're self-sufficient. There's going to come a point where that stuff's going to stop working out for us because we do better in a stable society where there are opportunities and hard work gets rewarded. And you're starting to see the beginning of a world where hard work's not going to matter as much. 
the rules are going to get written by people in power, and like you can tell, like all norms go out the window. Because if you're a young person in this country and you feel like you're getting shafted and you just want to get disengaged from the system, you have been shafted. You've been shafted through like crazy expensive college that doesn't even make sense. You're getting shafted by climate change. You are getting, and so because you're getting, you're just like, hey, I don't want to care, and I want to undo that. I want to un you. And so if you want to help me, <laughs> then like, vote me yeah. in the, so that, the, that's, the fact that that president is like being this truthful, but so cool and so chill about it. It's like, that is so fucking cool in my opinion. Like the way he's acting is so fucking, he's definitely going to have the internet if anything. But I do want to applaud Andrew Yang on something else. That he's being very real about this stuff, man. Like, Climate change is important, but when you broke, you're not going to think about it. You're not going to think about it. And when they put you through expensive college, like me, I went to college and people don't understand what I dropped out as soon as I could. And it's not that I dropped out because I didn't want to go to school. It's because, one, I didn't know what I was doing it for. I only went because my mom was pushing me to go. And two, I only, I was going because everyone was saying you're going to be a failure if you didn't. And that got into my head. I don't know why I let that shit get in my head. I wasted my time. And then number three, it was just so expensive and so stressful. I was already in my own apartment while in college in my first apartment. And it was just, the bills were just piling and piling. And, you know, I couldn't keep up my homework. And I was like you know what, okay, I'm going to be in another place or whatever. So I actually ended up leaving and I, I dropped out or whatever, and then I applied to go right back. The second time I applied to go back, I was living with my auntie, and she kicked me out because I couldn't pay her half the rent. I'm like, I'm in school. I can't. I got to focus on these classes. I'm trying to get back in school, and then I could figure out about a job schedule. She's like, she, nope, I'm not having it. Kicked me out just like that, and then... The uh, third time, uh, well, the yeah, the third time I got back in school, they said I got I actually got a grant this time, a scholarship, and I can't use that till next year. So that's why right now I'm just focusing on my business that I'm making money off of and trying to grow that. And when I go to school, hopefully, to be honest, I won't have to worry about paying. If I do have to pay, I don't have to pay for something. I don't have to worry about. It. I have plenty of money to do whatever I need to do. I think that's the thing too with college. It's so expensive. I feel like you should go in the workforce or build a business first, build your money up, then go to school. I don't know what the fuck is this. Oh, go to school, get your degree, this, this, and that. And then here you are with this debt. And yeah, you're making a lot of money, but you're buying all this shit you wanted from all your hard work. But now in the background, you got all this fucking debt. And if you don't have debt, you're still not above, you know, because. You got to make $100,000 median household income every year if you want to survive, if you just want to survive, you know. Um, yeah, you can live off 25, 30, 30,000 a year, but it's very, very difficult. Hey, you know, so uh, I think that this universal basic income give people another $25,000 a year. And the ones that work hard, they got the money. And the ones who don't, guess what? They send it home on their ass, but they're not getting anywhere. Capitalism at the, with, with capital. Because there's always going to be people on top. Now, I get why people are saying this is socialism. How? It can't really be socialism. I'm going to tell you how it can be socialism. If you give everyone $1,000 a month, but still keep the same economy... Think about it for a minute. If you give everyone a thousand dollars, right? But this isn't bound by hey, because socialism is everyone gets the same amount and you can't make any more. We control how much you make. That's not what's happening here. The universal basic income gives everyone a thousand dollars regardless of their income, and they can add on top of that money. So this does not make this a socialist thing anymore. And think about it, that extra money is gonna get put back in the economy anyway because people in America like to spend money on goods and services and technology things like that so if anything 